Eskarrik asko bai, Zagirre, e, jaun ari, eta momentu honetan e, lehen dakari agurtu nahiko nuke, berez ere egin gitan derraitu behar duelako, eta eskerrak eman kongresuan parte hartzeagatik eta gurekin e, egoteagatik. Beste bat arte, lehen dakari, eta irekira itzaldiarekin e, jarraitu behar dugu, e, bi ardatz izango ditu irekira itzaldi honek, batetik harremanak nola berregin eta bestetik nola, nola obetu ongizate e, estatua. Eta horretarako, gurekin daukagu Hilari Kotam, doktorea, gizarte kintzalia da bera, pentsalaria eta aholkulari politikoa, eta bibide luzea eta oparo egin du gizarte sistemen e, aldaketan. Su investigación y práctica actuales se centran en el futuro del trabajo y la organización en el contexto de la crisis ecológica y la revolución tecnológica. Hilaria es además profesora en el Instituto de Innovación y Propósito Público del University College de Londres. Mrs. Cotan, welcome. We are looking forward to hearing your contributions. Uh, good morning. I'm really honored to be here today to uh, talk with you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, this is, is it, can I, can it work? Is this one? Oh, okay, thank you. I'm going backwards. That's not a good start. Um, so uh, this is a place where I spent the early years of my life. Uh, the first years of my life were spent on a farm in Gecho, and the little girl on the right is me. <laughs> so I hope you don't feel that I have appropriated your culture, but uh, my family liked this photograph. And then, since then, in my adult years, it's a place, the Basque region, that I have admired for a long time, because you have a modern story of a very strong culture tied, <clears throat> as Professor Andoni was saying, to up to now a very strong and inclusive economy. And so this is a region that in my country we look to for lessons. At the same time, of course, you're facing, like everywhere in the globe, into times of uncertainty. And you're asking, what could we do to meet those new challenges? And in particular, how could we, in these uncertain times, strengthen the social bonds between us? How can we nurture the social foundations that we need to go forward in this century? and what would make this idea of what unites us real in the everyday. So we are living through a time of transition. A set of connected and very deep forces are transforming our world. Technology, ecology, and amongst younger populations in particular, a growing anger at the deep social injustice which is racial, gendered, spatial, and economic. And these are forces and energies that are changing our world, as previous speakers have already mentioned. And they contain huge possibility to work in new ways, to reconnect with our wider environments, to live in more equitable ways with one another. But at the moment, as citizens, what we feel is not excitement. We feel fear, we feel trepidation. And I think this is an appropriate response because we can see that the old ways of organizing things, everything from our politics to our work, our social lives, our communities, is no longer working. It's a challenge, as a previous speaker said, to our democracies. And in the time I have with you this morning, I want to suggest that one deep root of our problems is that we are relying, in particular, on social systems of support that no longer serve us, and that we need to think again about our social infrastructure. So our European welfare systems, our health services, our education, our housing, our social support systems were a very audacious and brave dream. So emerging in the 20th century from the chaos of various wars, world war in particular, deep economic depression and poverty that preceded the war, citizens and leaders across societies and across different political parties in Europe dared to imagine. And the early decades of the 20th century were an era of institutional renaissance. You had in 1918 the creation of the Basque Society. You had in the early years of the 20th century the creation of the United Nations, the formation of the trade unions, and civil society, civil society organizations that confronted poverty across the globe. And also, of course, the design of welfare systems. 
And one of the most important architects of 20th century welfare systems was this British man, William Beveridge, that you see here on the right. And in the blueprint for the British welfare state, which you see on the left, he wrote in the opening pages, this is a time for revolution, not for patching and mending. And so the dream wasn't just of stitching people back together when things went wrong, but ensuring that every person, wherever you were born, whoever you were, would have a guaranteed foundation for a flourishing life. And Beveridge became a very sought-after personality. As you know, we in Britain, we are extremely colonial and we have a habit of exporting everything. And so Beveridge went to America and he worked with Roosevelt on the New Deal. He worked with the Scandinavian governments on their welfare systems. In 1946, he came to Spain. I have got a picture of him in El País where he gave a public speech surrounded by phalanges. He was a complete political maverick and he would talk to anybody who listened about ideas for new social systems. But by training, he was a labor economist. And his main central concern was, how could we find good work as the pillar of a good society? And at the time when he was working, the academic and political consensus was that unemployment and underemployment were a problem, a, a three-pronged problem. So the first was that people believed that wages were too high. The second was that people believed that migration was the problem, that too many people were coming from the countryside. And thirdly, people believed the problem was of weak personal character, that people were lazy and they just wouldn't take the work available. Maybe this sounds quite familiar to you. But Beveridge saw things completely differently. What he argued was that the problem was one of industrial transition and that a new carbon-based industrial economy was creating new forms of work and people needed new models, new routes into work, new forms of support, so new education, new health services, and so on. And I think what was remarkable about Beveridge was that he didn't just write about this. What he did was he started to experiment in practice. And in the 1930s, he moved to the east end of London, then a very poor area of London with very high unemployment. And he started to develop the welfare systems through a prototype, through basically putting a service into a shop and discovering how he could support people into work. And you see here the first labor exchange, and people who were unemployed could go here, and they could get advice, and they could get money, and, they, and this would help them in a time of unemployment and to find work. But I think what's even more remarkable is that if you are out of work in Britain today, you have to use exactly the same service. So this is just around the corner from where I live in South London. And if you don't have a job today, you go, you join the queue, just as Beveridge designed in 1930. You get advice. Of course, now it's through computers on the desk. And you get money. Now, of course, in real terms, it's much less money. But these services, which cost billions of pounds to run, are exactly the same. So I think it's no surprise in a completely different economy that these services have a 66% failure rate. So when I spend time in the job centers, I meet people going around for the second, the third, sometimes the 15th time. And if we think that we're in a different technological transition, it really isn't surprising that a service designed in the 1930s but is still replicated today would not be offering us social support. The way we find work today is completely different. Maybe you can think for a moment how you found your last job. Most of us, eight out of 10 people, find their work through social connection, through somebody they know. And even if you found your job through an advert and an interview process, it was probably a friend who said to you, hey, look, they're looking for this person. Why don't you go and have a look and think about it? So what enables us to find good work today and to progress in work is not a CV on the desk, advice in a job center. It is about rich social connections and very diverse social connections. We have to know one another in new ways if we're going to find work and progress in that work. But this is not just a UK problem. Also, I also wanted to say that we have, a, a, to talk, I'll come back to this about, we don't want just to find work, we want to find work with meaning. Because all over the world, we see exactly the same systems in place. You're out of work, go and join a queue. Or perhaps you're unwell, and so we're investing in 20th century hospitals all around the globe to cure modern problems of disease. Or we're building all over the world factories for education when we need very different forms of education. So this mindset, this 20th century social mindset, is infecting and determining still the systems that we're building in the 21st century. 
It's extremely costly in terms of money, but also, I think, in terms of what happens to us as humans, because these social solutions can no longer support us in very different, social, in very different societies and in very different economies. And when we can't find the social solutions, when we can't count on our children having the right education, when we can't be sure that there'll be care there when we're older, when we don't know if there's work with meaning that will support a good life, we begin to feel uncertain. And the result of that is anger, isolation, and polarization. So you could say, I would say, that we have a social emergency. And the question is, what should we do? And finding answers to these challenges has been my work now for several decades. And so I wanted to share with you this morning three examples of how we could rethink in practice about work, health, and care for older citizens. And I want to do that through these three very practical examples, think about what a 21st century social infrastructure would look like, and then talk about what is the role that each of us should play in this transformation. So I think the first thing to say is that we are not going to create new systems, the systems we need for this century if we work in 20th century ways. That new systems are born through new ways of working and sometimes actually through recovery of old ways of working that were very important but that we've forgotten. And these are the words of Audre Lorde, an African-American feminist. And I think they're really important because we can use consultation, let's say, with citizens to find new ways of efficiency, to find new optimization of 20th century citizens. But if we really want to make the transformation, the revolution, not just patch people back together, then we need to think about something very different. And I started out three decades ago working in Africa and Latin America. So I worked in communities where poverty was very acute and the need for change was stark. I worked in war zones, I worked with big international charities, and then I worked with the World Bank. And in all of these institutions, I was part of very well-intentioned programs to change the lives of others. I worked alongside colleagues from whom I learned a lot who were really trying to bring about genuine change. But I watched as time and time again, the mores, the structures, the politics of these institutions stood in the way of the change they were trying to create. I could see that sometimes ideas worked just for a short time. Sometimes, actually, when they were implemented, Maybe it's too revolutionary. Ah, oh, I'm back. Um, so, yeah, so I was saying that, that really I, what I watched was that very good intention programs became something else in implementation. And it persuaded me that I needed to go back to the beginning and start again to think about how we would do this work of transformation. I realized very profoundly that we needed a completely different way of working to create social change. And I started to create the design process I use today. This is very early beginnings. I lived a long time in the Dominican Republic working in the barrios there, and that's where I began to develop the tools and processes that I use today in Europe. I think most importantly that this new way of working means stepping outside institutions and the frames of reference we have. And I say this because I'm sure many of us here are engaged in participatory work. We go out maybe to consult with communities. But do we really start rooted in the shared realities, in the shoes of those people whose lives we are trying to support? Most often, in fact, we do something else. We start with the mindset of the institution. So we go out and we don't say, what does good health look like in the 21st century? Or what would it mean for you to flourish? What we say is, oh, could you help us improve our health systems? And I'm talking about something very different. I'm talking about imagining together what it is to flourish in this century and start from there. And this is a way of working which turns on its head all preconceived ideas of how we create policy, institutions, and where knowledge lies. And I think it's one of, and one of the reasons, many reasons, that I'm so excited to be here today because uh, the society brings together civil society, academics, and political leaders. And it's this kind of fomentation of ideas together that is going to enable us to transform our social systems in this century. So how does this work in practice? So I started out by... Uh, having experienced what, what failing there is in the job centre, of persuading somebody who works, who runs the job centre in South London near where I live, to allow me in. And we put up a false door and we put up this poster that said, get yourself out of here. And we said to everybody in the queue, 
if you want to work in a different way, if you don't think standing in the queue is going to help us, you can give us five euros, about equivalent, five pounds, and you can come through the door. And so many people wanted to come through the door that we kept rising the, raising the price. And when we got to 20 euros, like we still, we had too many people. And we were like, okay, okay, enough. No more people can come through the door. But this was the start of a new social approach. And so what we did then was we asked everybody who came through the door that day in the job center to meet us again in cafes over the next months. And we talked to people about what, what are you actually looking for? What support do you really need? Most importantly, what are your dreams? What are you really wanting to do? And from there, we started to build a new uh, service. And the thing about this service was that we never asked people what their formal qualifications were. We didn't ask them for a CV or anything about their education. We asked them, what's the dream that you have? Where do you want to start? And we developed a service that we called Backer, which basically connected people and their dreams together in new ways and enabled people to make their first steps. And what's important about this is that it costs 20% of only 20% of what it costs to run a formal unemployment service in Britain. It helped 54% of those who've been very long-term unemployed, which no existing service supports, back into work. And it helped 87% of people find progress. This is uh, randomized controlled data from the first 2,000 members we had. Um, we use technology, which is something I want to come back to, not for people to find jobs online, but to connect people, to bring them into social spaces and enable them to work together. So what we created, I think, is really important because it isn't a jobs club. Backer is not something that asks people who are out of work to come together. What it does in communities is it asks people who are in work, out of work, in between work, to all come together to meet. So we host evenings that say, an evening for people that are interested in society, an evening for people that are interested in travel. So we have very broad themes, and we bring people together in this way so that people make connections with people who are, for, who are in, already in industries that want to work in different ways and that can help each other. And so how does this work for Earl on the left-hand side here? So he's one of the first people we met. And when we met him, this gentleman, he was in his, 19, he was in his 50s. Uh, he had just come out of prison for dealing kind of small amounts of drugs. And he was being told by the job center that he should get a job as a security guard or he should get a job washing up in the kitchen. And he was like, I don't want a job. I want a profession. And we were like, OK, so what profession do you want? And he said, well, I want to be a chef. So it wasn't realistic for Earl, who'd just come out of prison and had no qualifications to be a chef. But what we said to him was, OK, why don't you take that job washing up in the kitchen and we'll stand alongside you. And when you've done a certain amount of time in the kitchen, then we'll kind of move you and progress you. And today, Earl, he's not a chef, but he's a very highly qualified cook in a restaurant. So this is really important, this social connection of saying, who would give Earl a chance? How can we stand alongside him whilst he continues to progress? Because the idea of a 20th century welfare system is we just move you from this point to this point. We've met our target and we say goodbye. The idea of kind of social welfare systems is that we'll stand alongside you, we will help you to continue to grow and develop. Um, I think as it was said in the introduction, my current work is about imagining um, how work uh, is in this century, and my current project um, is about how we design good work, um, particularly uh, in, in the context of which Professor Andoni was talking about where industrial work is disappearing, and I've been running research in five post-industrial British locations and three US locations. And I've been asking workers from all walks of life, health workers, carers, uh, consultants, financial people, lawyers, everybody in different groups from the same walk of life, what good work looks like and how we could create it locally. Um, and you'll have to invite me back to talk about that. I'm not going to talk about that today. But the answer, I can tell you straight away, is that we have to foster rich, deep social institutions. And increasingly, there's a narrative in our societies which is, let's get the economy right, and when the economy is right, then let's invest in social institutions. In fact, I think in the Basque region, you've done very well at holding out against that story. But what we need to think is, let's invest in social institutions, and then our economy will grow. It's the other way around. So let me turn to my second example, which is about health. So this lady here on the right is called Anne, and I think she's the perfect symbol of our health challenges today. She is a lady in her 50s. She has got a whole range of chronic conditions. She has, uh, she's morbidly obese. She has diabetes. She has a heart condition. And she also has respiratory problems. 
And when we met Anne, she told us that her full-time job was going to doctor's appointments. She felt very depressed because she could no longer walk to the bus stop to wait for the bus. She couldn't reach up to wash her hair. And she felt that her life had become completely stuck. So the first thing we did was we asked all these doctors from all these different conditions if they would come and meet with us. And immediately, for the first time, all these very specialist doctors saw the whole person that was Anne. And they said, well, before it was like looking through a letterbox. We could just see this tiny bit. You know, I'm the diabetes specialist. I'm the heart specialist. Now we can see the whole person. And the first thing they did was they took out half the drugs that she was on. And they were like, well, if you're prescribing this drug and I'm prescribing this drug, let's not kind of do all of this together. But also they began to reflect, which is something so important about our 20th century health systems, is how vertical they are, how they couldn't see the patient, because the way that knowledge and information moves through these systems is through all these levels. And it's like a process, I don't know, in English we have this expression, Chinese whispers, which is by the time it comes to the top, somebody's telling a completely different story. And by the time the advice comes back down to the bottom, of course, it's completely different again. And so I think that this is one of the challenges of our systems, which is that 70% of the finance in any European health system is going on diseases that cannot be cured. Because we don't have another way to work with people like Anne, we put them into industrial health systems, systems which can't address most of the conditions and in which we can't actually take good care of people. So what we need to do instead is think about how we take that really important knowledge, professional knowledge, in the vertical systems, and we fold it into new horizontal systems, which put on a level medical knowledge, but also neighborly knowledge, community knowledge, work, and we begin to work in a completely new way. And so um, in communities, we uh, designed a service that we called Wellogram that could do this. And we started off in doctor's surgeries uh, in the, in the main general practice, the first doctor that anybody in Britain needs, asking them to send us what they call in Britain, heart, doctors call heart sink patients. And the reason these patients like Anne are called heart sink patients is because when the patient walks in, the doctor's heart sinks. Because the doctor can see that this person has got all kinds of social, physical, mental problems. And a doctor in Britain has 10 minutes to see a patient. And it would be impossible to start to really listen and address all these multiple problems in a 10-minute appointment. And so the doctor's heart sinks. So we said to the doctors in the surgeries and the clinics we were working, anybody that you think is a heart sink patient, please send them out the side to us. And we had uh, what we called relational workers. And the relational workers, the main skill they had was knowing how to listen. So Anne went and sat with, this is a drawing of Amy, one of our relational workers, and she started to talk about her life. And she talked about how 10 years before her husband had become unwell, that she had begun to try to take care of her husband. And through this process, she had kind of lost her social connections. She'd stopped taking exercise herself. And she, as well, had gradually become unwell. And this is a very typical pattern where the carers of others become very unwell themselves. And then it's very poignant. She said to Amy, you know, I really actually feel you're listening to me. And she kind of grew courage because she could tell that she was being really listened to. And Amy said to her, well, what do you think would be the first thing that would change your life? And she said, Anne said, I think the thing that would help me most would be to start my embroidery again. It would just give me a bit of time for myself. So Amy said, OK, well, go away and start doing your needlework and come back in a week and we'll see how you're doing. And this was really typical, that almost nobody in the service chooses a health intervention. They're unwell, but they don't start with something of health. Everybody who comes to us knows what their diet should look like. They know they should be taking exercise. They know all the medical advice. But actually, if you have any kind of chronic health condition, making change in your life and then sustaining that change in your life is very, very difficult. So if we start instead with what people want to do themselves and then they build confidence because they, they've chosen something and wants to do her embroidery, she can do her embroidery and then she comes back, then we can gradually move. And this is how this service worked. So then the next week Anne came back and then Amy's built a relationship of trust and she can start to say, okay, so should we think about what you're eating or should we think about walking to the bus stop and so on? 
Um, and so we developed a programme called Social Health. And we call it Social Health because, first of all, we start with a social diagnosis. What do people need in their full lives, not a health diagnosis? And secondly, once people have got confidence, we begin to insert them in groups. So first of all, Amy and Anne, uh, Anne work one-to-one. -one. Then when Anne's got a bit of courage, we begin to say to her, OK, well, we've got a social network over here. We can introduce you to this social network. You can't do that at the beginning, but once we've built confidence, we can do that. And so through the social network, the changes that Anne has made in her life, she can sustain in a group. Ah, I've lost my slide that tells you, well, there's some at the bottom, but tells you the kind of the, the, the data from this. But I think what's important about the data, which the doctors couldn't believe, what was great about working in the clinics is the, the doctors have long run clinical uh, data on these patients. And they saw to their surprise, because we weren't doing any health interventions, that 64% of people improved their health, 72% of people went back to work, 75% of people sustained weight loss. This is kind of uh, data over a five year period. So thirdly and finally, I just want to talk to you about aging. So um, uh, Wellagram, as we called it, the health project, is an example of where we got into a state system and we intervened to change the state system. This aging work is an example of where we worked in parallel in civil society to take the pressure off a state system. So we can see that 21st century social infrastructure can work in various different ways. So I think we've already mentioned um, the demographic change in the Basque region and an aging population, which is, of course, the case for uh, all European societies. Um, aging was not considered. When we designed our welfare systems, nobody knew that people were going to live so long in older age. And so the orthodox view is to say, this is a crisis. We haven't got enough money. Everybody's lonely. Um, you know, what are we going to do? We're never going to be able to take care of people. We can't raise enough taxes. Our systems can't cope. It's a burden. We said, what about a different way of thinking about this, which is that in European societies, 80% of wealth is held by the population over 60. And when I talk about wealth, I mean money, definitely, but also knowledge, time, all forms of resource. And the problem, of course, is that this wealth is not evenly distributed. It's very unevenly distributed. But actually, this is a population with enormous resource. And if we thought about how we could encourage that population to come together and use that resource, we would have a completely different solution. So we started by asking what this might look like. And we went to a neighborhood that was a very low income neighborhood in, in London. And we brought together businesses. Then we brought together people who lived in the area. We brought together health professionals, welfare professionals. And we worked across civil society to ask what a good aging looked like. And people, I mean, we had 65 insights. We had so many different things. But essentially, people told us that three things really matter to them. The first is that everybody wants somebody to take care of the little things. If you're an older person, you don't want to kind of wait for somebody to come and change the light bulb whilst you fall over in the dark. Like, you know, in Britain we have a number you can call and somebody will eventually come and help you, but by then you've probably fallen over and you've gone to hospital. What would, what would it look like to have on-demand support for the small things in life? The second thing was that people said they wanted to spend time with people you, they like. So many people like Anne, for instance, have lost connection with their friends and they are lonely. But what they don't want is a befriending service where somebody comes to visit them because they feel sorry for them. They want some way of naturally, organically making friends, like we make friends at every age in our life because we actually like people, because we want to do things, that we like doing the same things as those people. And the third thing people told us was that they wanted to live life with purpose. That, you know, we're really aware that we're going to have this long third age. We want to live it in a very dynamic way. Perhaps we don't want to carry on with the same job, but we certainly don't want to kind of just be at home watching TV or do a kind of narrow range of things. And actually, people told us they wanted life coaches. They said, you know, wouldn't it be great if everybody, when they got to 65, got a life coach? And somebody came to your home, and there was a discussion about what, what, what would your life look like for the next 30 years? So then we invited the people we'd met back into our studio in South London, and we asked them, you know, this is what you've told us. Does it look right to you? Can you now help us design the service? And this is a really critical way of how I work, and it might be the way that you work here. It's definitely not the way that policy is made in Britain. How policy is made in Britain is we go into the communities, we talk to people, we go back to our offices in, in universities and, um, and especially in government, and then we design the service, and then we put the money behind it, and we roll it out. What we do is we tinker, and we do really small things. We watch whether they work or fail, and then we adjust them. And a really classic idea was this life coach. 
Everybody had told us they wanted life coaches. And if we'd been classic policymakers, we'd have gone back to our offices and we'd have hired a lot of life coaches and we'd have developed a service with life coaches. Everybody who's 65 gets time with a life coach. So we employed life coaches and we sent them, three lovely people, to kind of begin to talk to the, the early members. And everybody hated it. They were like, oh, this is like so in your face. I don't know who's translating how you can translate in your face, but this is just too abrupt. We don't want a life coach. What we want is to have coffee with a friend and discuss these things. It was just too awful. So we said, you know, okay, goodbye to our lovely life coaches, and we're going to do this in a different way through kind of social interaction. But it's a really good example of how people say they want something, and only in practice with people do you find out what's really working. So we uh, developed something called Circle, which is uh, doing really well 10 years on. It's a membership organization for the third age, and it basically offers members, uh, you can stay sorted, you can call a phone number, and we'll help you with small practical things. We have a rich social calendar, and we'll socially connect you, and we'll think about what it actually means to live life with purpose in the third age. And so what it looks like is that people join for a very small sum of money, about three pounds a month if they can afford it, and obviously if they can't, because it's very kind of locally organized, then the organizer knows and they allow people to join. And um, people get practical support, there's a free phone number, as I said, and then there's a social calendar. And so people uh, go and do things together, they might go to an art gallery, they might meet up in somebody's house to have coffee, uh, they might join together to watch a football match, and also they help each other out. So people m m pick somebody up out of hospital, they make sure that there's food in the house, that they'll have something to eat, and so on. Um, and one of the things that I haven't got much time to talk about, but I, I would if I could, is about technology. Because one of the things that we see happening at the moment in Europe is that our 20, what we're using technology for is to put 20th century systems online. So we're not changing the social systems, we're just putting them online and hoping that a citizen can better access them online. But technology gives us this incredibly powerful potential of changing the business model. And this is what we've done with Circle. So a traditional aging service has got buildings that people meet in and work from, it's got minivans that have to be maintained to collect people and take them to hospital and so on. And what we have is just a really simple, free piece of technology. And what it does is, in real time, it connects people to each other. So it shows you every space in the city that you could have a coffee morning, or in the neighborhood. It's quite neighborhood located. It shows you different people that are able to offer not one day a week, because most people won't sign up to help each other one day a week, but could offer a little bit of time at this point on a Tuesday, or live in this street so could collect this neighbor's shopping on their way home. And so behind the scenes, this technology connects everything that's needed in real time. We don't ask any of our members to use the technology. They can if they want, but mainly they just either get a printed newsletter or they call on a normal telephone, an 0800 line. But behind the scenes, this technology is taking out all the cost of the service. And so what's really important about this, again, is it's about social connection. Circle is never talks about aging. It's not something for older people. Anybody can join, and it's really important that people join from the age 50 onwards. Because if you have a, a society of people in their 90s who are all very frail and they want to go to an art exhibition, this is incredibly complicated to organize. You need people to go with them, you need special kinds of transport. If you have a society which is incredibly mixed, it's really easy. One person in a wheelchair, five other people, everybody can go to the art gallery. So it's really thinking about, in all of these examples, from work through to aging, how do we design these 21st, social, 21st century social systems where it feels natural to join with everybody else, with people who are not like us? And through that, we develop systems that not only support people, but people actually want to use. So um, I've, I've got here the capability measures. We know that if we want to kind of design new systems that maintain a different culture, we have to measure different things. And one of the things we measure in all our services is capability. Like, are people growing themselves, and do they feel they're growing? Sometimes we ask questions, but mainly we collect this through the technology. So we measure, for instance, has somebody gone out more? Are they going out more with somebody that they didn't know before? 
this means that they've created a new connection. Of course, we're also measuring kind of traditional data. So we can see, for example, that where Circle exists, it's taken out 20% of the cost of a formal health system because most of the costs of hospitals in Britain is older people continually returning to hospital because when they get home, there's nobody to look after them. So we're taking cost out of the formal system. But what matters to us is the culture of people flourishing. So we're measuring capabilities in our, in our service. So these three examples, um, Perhaps I should have talked about youth because somebody earlier talked about youth. We could talk about that. But basically what they've done is they've grown and tested. So we've grown from the bottom up and tested a, a new code, if you like, that replaces the 20th century blueprint that Beveridge developed that I showed you for welfare systems. And this code has six very simple principles that if we followed would be very transformative of our systems. So the first thing is to move away from this mindset that says, ah, oh, here's the social problem, how can we fix it? To telling a completely different story about what does the good life look like in the 21st century? In the 20th century, when our welfare systems were designed, people didn't talk about services. They talked about what people need to grow a good life. And of course, some of the answer to that was a service. But in my work, I say service last. Let's think about what we need to grow a good life. And then if we connect citizens together, what would happen? And then, of course, we need some services, but let's not make that the kind of immediate kind of first move that we make. The second thing is that we need to develop capability. And I think that in the 21st century, citizens need these four capabilities without which they can't grow good lives. So the first is that we need the ability to work and learn and continually work and learn. And by this, as you've seen, I don't just mean get a certificate from a school or a university. I mean the ability to continually kind of work, learn, challenge our mindsets. We need health. We need uh, inner health, uh, mental health, and we need physical vitality. We need to see our place in the community. We need to feel that we belong. And in this century, we need to feel that we belong at a micro level in our neighborhood. We need to feel it in the city. And because our problems are planetary, we need to have some sense of ourselves as well as planetary citizens. And then we need, as you've seen, a network of relationships. Because the challenge of 21st century problems is that no leader, however great they are, whether they're at the top of the health service or whether they're a political leader, can command change. We can't say to people, you know, live differently to be healthy or recycle all your rubbish. All the big problems, health, environment, whatever, you, whatever they are, need citizens to participate. And to participate, we need to be in a rich and diverse network of relationships. And so all these four things matter. And um, we've got a, a system of, of measuring them. Um, I'm working with the work of Amartya Sen, uh, the Nobel Prize winning economist, and Martha Nussbaum, uh, the philosopher who many of you may know, and they developed this capability framework. And the capability framework asks this apparently very simple question, which is, what can I really do or be? And it's very simple, but it's very powerful, because you might be somebody, let's say, an older person that lives here in this incredible city, and, you know, this city, it's got everything. It's got industry, it's got bars, it's got cafes, it's got beautiful churches. I mean, I walked around last night, it's incredible here. I want to come back on holiday. But, but you might be a citizen like Anne that is living in the middle of all of this, but you can't actually access it. So it looks from data like you're living in a city with lots going on, but you, the citizen, can't access it. It might also be that you've been brought up in a neighborhood where you've been told that you can't, you can't do anything. Maybe you live quite close to the Mercedes factory, but you actually have been told that you'll never get the school certificates to work in that factory. So this is very, very complicated in this century about how we internalize stories about ourselves and also actual possibilities. I think maybe when the professor was talking about who am I, it was also addressing some of these questions. So what is important about the capability approach is it works on these two levels, with the internal feeling of the citizen of what we can be and the external social political culture that allows us to access certain things or not. So we're working on these two levels. And I think the other thing that's really important to say is that capabilities are about a continual process of growth and development. So these 21st century systems are organic in nature. They're not transactional. They're not industrial. They're not about moving the citizen from point A to point B, saying that we've met the metric, and then saying goodbye. They're about thinking about all the time living, growing, developing, helping one another. And in all our services, people who've done really well 
let's say, in Bacca or Wellagram, we keep them in the service because then they can help other people. There's nothing like peer support. So we want as many people in as possible. And um, one, of, one of my colleagues, one of my design colleagues, says that, that one of the things that we do is we say, how could we design a service that is stronger the more people that use it? And this is very countercultural because, you know, in, in Britain with our welfare services, what we do is we spend a lot of money keeping people out of services, assessing people. Are you really poor enough? Are you really sick enough? Are you, have you really been out of work long enough? Oh, well, then you can come into our system. And lots of money and professional time goes on kind of keeping people out of the systems. But what we're designing with these 21st century systems are systems that are better the more citizens that join. So if you think about a circle, if you have got all your over 50s in, then you've got this incredibly strong network. You've got loads of people to help each other, to pick up the shopping, to do the lifts, to go to the social, the social uh, activities. So this is how we're thinking about everything. Let's design things that are stronger than more citizens who are part of it. So I don't need to go through all of these, but uh, I think relationships are the most important. What we've seen through our measures over a decade of work, which should have been obvious from the beginning, is that it is above all relationships. And I don't know if you have um, the game of Jenga where you take out the, do you have this game where you take out the, the wooden pole and you wait to see if the whole thing falls over? And I think in our societies we can take out certain things, but if we take out the relationships with people who are, are like strong relationships across society, then the whole thing falls over. We're thinking in different ways about resource. As you can see, we're connecting multiple forms of resource, state resource, private resource, time. This is very 21st century. In the 20th century, money as well was very vertically organized. Oh, well, the state has got this, and this department in the state has got this, and this business has got that, and we can't blend them. All these new models need to think about how we blend resource so that we have enough. We have to create possibility, something I'm going back to. We have to set aside risk mindsets that stop us growing, and we have to take care of everybody. So uh, when I was invited here, the organizers of the conference asked me if I could make a proposal. And I don't think, given everything that is so strong about the Basque region, that I could be so bold, so atrevida, to make a proposal. But I would like, in closing, to leave you with some thoughts about this current moment and about what I think really creates change and change that sticks. So the first thing is, I think we have to tell stories. That stories are what makes change. Change doesn't happen with a political proposal, a command, a management document that says, you know, this is how we're going to move from A to B. Stories bring in emotion. They make us feel part of something. They help us reframe the problem. They show us what is working already, what's strong, not what's wrong. And then they help bring us together. And this is a region of storytelling. This is a region that um, you know, has an incredible culture of poetry, of literature, of, of all forms of sort of high storytelling and everyday storytelling. And I think this is something really, really strong in the culture. I read all of this in translation, but I think this is something really strong in the culture that we can draw on. The second thing is we need to widen the frame and we need to invest in those new networks. And most of all, we need to make sure that everything we design connects to people who are not like us. Maybe the people who didn't want to come to the conference today. Why did they not want to come? Who's not here? And how can we connect to those people? That's what it means to be a new horizontalist. And I think all of us here today want to be the horizontalist. We want to create those different networks. The third thing is about creating possibility. So this goes back to my opening slide about radical uncertainty. One of the things about the economic and social frameworks that have become dominant in the last decades across Western society is that they are risk-driven. They are all about trying to kind of measure what might happen, predict what might happen, and then control what might happen. But these systems are extremely resource-intensive. And actually, it's not possible in the world that we're working in to predict. We don't know what's going to happen. And certainly with the things that I'm talking about, aging, physical and mental illness, these are uncertain things. And no amount of data and modeling and talk of managing the risk will help. Instead, we need to say, OK, what do we dream of? What's the possibility? Let's move into that space, which has a completely different energy and enables us to create in new ways. The fourth thing I want to say is to take care of everybody. So a flourishing society is one that can take care of all its citizens, uh, its workers and its leaders. And I think that everybody has a role to play. 
academics are really important at the moment. I talk in my work about uh, from taking from Gramsci, the idea of organic intellectuals. We need the big ideas of intellectuals, and then we need to think about how those big ideas can connect in language and storytelling to citizens in a way that can carry everybody. We need the energy, the activism. I think you're going to talk about the models that are already being developed on the ground in communities by civil society. Incredible innovation is happening everywhere, but it's always at the margins and it isn't given the resource to flourish. So we need to bring those citizen models to the center. And then we need to think in particular about political leaders. This is really a time for leadership. And uh, the Brazilian political theorist, Roberto Unger, asks uh, leaders, are you going to be humanizers of the inevitable? Is the only role today in these very difficult decades for political leaders to humanize inevitable bad things? And I think not. I think that everybody who joins public service at any level actually is here to make change, and we need to have the courage to make that change. And I talk about political leaders in my book, Radical Help, as gardeners, that the idea is that, the, that nothing can change without politics. We have to go, the political leader has to set out the garden, they have to make the parameters, you know, the vegetables are going to be here, the flowers are going to be over here, so that then everybody else can come in and garden. The political leaders have to help with the watering Otherwise, nothing will grow. And of course, sometimes they have to do the weeding as well, because we do have things that need to be taken out, which is very important. But I think I'd really like to ask in particular that political leaders think of themselves in this different way as the gardeners of the new. And finally, I want to say uh, to be radical. Because radical, the word radical means to go back to the roots. And I think here in the Basque country, you have these beautiful and radical roots in your nature, in your language, your industry, your culture, and these are the seeds of renewal. So we have to ask not how we can make small change here and there, because our moment is too big. We can't ask how can we manage things better and just move this data a little bit higher so, oh, people are not quite so sick or older people are just a bit better taken care of. No, we have to ask a really foundational question. How do we, our people, our nature, our culture, flourish in this century? And it's so exciting that, you know, you, this, is, this is what these three days are about. And uh, thank you so much for asking me here and for allowing me to set out some opening thoughts. I have a book which sets this all out, which I, uh, has been translated in many languages, but neither Basque nor Spanish. But uh, for those of you who want to kind of learn more about the data and the way that I work, uh, it is in the book. But thank you so much for inviting me. I think we have some time now for questions. I hope I've left some time for questions. Galderarik edo ongo litzateke? Kotan anderari inork zerbait galdetu nahi dio? Be brave. Euskeraz edo gaztelera zegin dezakezu eta kero itzuliko zaio, eh? No questions? Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much, Mrs. Kotan. Eta orain e, kafetxo bat hartzeko e, eten bat egingo dugu, e, amabietan elduko diogu garapen ekonomikoaren blokeari, eta eskatu behar dizuet e, amabietan puntual e, asteko, ba, eserita egon gaitezen guztiok, bale? Disfrutatu kafeaz, orain arte.